Hi, uh, welcome to uh, Bill Day 2. It is Sunday and I see all of us made it through the night, um, which makes me pretty happy. Um, and uh, we're going to kick off uh, today's Space Stage uh, presentation. Um, I am I'm Clive, I'm with XCore at the LA Space Salon, and this is Scott. He's at SpaceX and also at the LA Space Salon. And uh, uh, th th this room is uh, our little um, way to uh, expose Bill community to the space community, as opposed to space community to the Bill community. So, uh, without further ado, I guess we'll, we'll kick it off with the first speaker, who is uh, Rex Reidenauer, who uh, I just had a brief conversation with him, and he basically just dropped a list of uh, a whole lot of innovative companies that he's worked for, including you know Microcosms and uh, um, you know, he's JPL. He's done a lot of other stuff. Um, he's been doing this for a very long time. He's been working in the rocket business for a very long time. And uh, he wants to talk to you about something that uh, appears to be the Rocket Cam, um, the Ecliptic Corporation. So uh, I will hand it over to Rex, and uh, he can talk about this. Now, uh, use the slide. You, you, t you touch it, just slide it forward. Um, yeah, you swipe it. Okay, thanks, Clive. Good morning, everybody. Um, what I wanted to talk about, uh, we're based in Pasadena, Ecliptic, and uh, I think most people that are interested in space, especially young people, want to go someday, and right now not many people can go. You uh, basically have a, a few opportunities with the government, and hopefully a few years from now, more opportunities with folks like Virgin Galactic and X-Corps, at least to get into space altitude. But uh, short of that, about the only thing you can do is take pictures and take video out there, and hopefully enjoy it vicariously. So that's what we do. This Rocket Cam product family uh, is about uh, the only way you can really get a, an onboard view of what's going on with some of these vehicles, uh, something like this video system. We happen to do most of them. I'll get into that. Uh, we do most of them in the US, uh, not all, but uh, it's a great way to vicariously enjoy what's going on. And I just wanted to take some of the mystery out of how this happens and give you a feeling for what the systems involved are. And. Uh, what I'm trying to describe is, I think you're mostly familiar with uh, these kinds of views. They're getting more and more common. They started in this country uh, with uh, live video anyway in about 1997 on un uh, unmanned rockets and spacecraft. Um, as you remember, all the way back to the first manned missions we had in this country, all the way through uh, Gemini, Apollo, shuttle, space station, Skylab, we had onboard views like this uh, with crew involved every mission. But it was very rare to do this on a rocket, an unmanned rocket or a spacecraft. First started in 1992 and 93 on Pegasus. And uh, that sort of uh, went fallow for a few years and came back up on the Delta II. This is this Delta II view here. And ever since, it's been going pretty well uh, actively every year. So uh, the first version of this system is called the uh, analog video system. That's what we call it anyway. What that means is it's pretty simple. All you do is turn it on and there's a camera involved and uh, one or two cameras typically on these vehicles and they start transmitting live video. And that's about all you can do is transmit live video, hopefully receive it on the ground somewhere. If you don't, you don't get it. And uh, what's typically involved, here's a Delta II and uh, there's some electronics inside the second stage typically that uh, controls the on and off state of the video. There's a battery pack often. Uh, not always, but most of the time on Delta, it's a battery pack driven thing. The whole thing is only on for about an hour and a half at most, sometimes less. And typically on a Delta II, there's a camera pod on the outside on the second stage. This is the end of the second stage here. Oh, uh, this is the second stage. The first stage is right here. Occasionally, there's a view that's on the first stage way down below to watch these solid rocket motors pop off up close. This particular view is from this pod here. On an Atlas, uh, which is the comparable rocket uh, that kind of competes with Delta, the uh, pod is a little different, but it's a very similar camera inside. It's typically mounted up here on the second stage. You can just barely see it even blown up in this view because the rocket's pretty large. Uh, occasionally they do a view that's on the second stage right here looking forward to watch the fairing come off and also watch the, sec the Centaur stage. Uh, part from the first stage. So a typical view on the Atlas is like this. Uh, all these views are dramatic. They're all used on uh, all the applications we've been on for technical reasons to begin with. But once you get the video going, it's, it's just good G-Wiz video. It's good for all the stakeholders. And it uh, 
gives everybody a feeling for what's going on. So over the years, uh, we're up to 105 launches of uh, Rocket Cam. 96 of those have been on rockets like this, and the other nine have been on spacecraft. Actually, doing video on board spacecraft. I'll get into that later. Uh, typical views, like I showed you here. There's some really good engineering stuff you can do with this. Like here's a view of a Delta IV second stage engine uh, powering underway in the dark side of the Earth uh, during the shadow. And the engineers were able to deduce what the temperatures were across this engine nozzle just by looking at the, the way the thing glowed red hot. You can see all sorts of mechanical things going on. Here's a good view on the Atlas looking forward of the very large payload fairing. It's the first time they used a fairing on the Atlas V that was about the length of this whole room here, this whole briefing room. And uh, huge floppy structure, it came off in halves, and this is one of the halves flying off from the forward end of the Atlas. So over the years, uh, we've been on all of these rockets in the U.S., and uh, there's probably about six more I didn't have on this figure. Most of them related to missile defense target rockets that launch targets up to shoot down by other interceptors. But um, we have all these, uh, all these rockets under our belt now, and uh, we've got a few strange vehicles too. You, uh, you're aware of the shuttle, the uh, foam falling uh, incidents on the shuttle, those were all caught by our cameras up on the external tank. We're, we're up, up near the nose of the external tank here. And this is the return to flight shuttle launch where they thought they had the foam problem solved and uh, lo and behold there was a huge piece of foam that came off. Fortunately it didn't hit the leading edge like they thought it did on Columbia. But uh, nonetheless this uh, incident caused the shuttle program to stand down for another whole year until they figured out why they didn't solve the foam problem. And uh, the important thing about this video, besides the fact they just saw it, is they got the time that the foam fell off, which was a really big clue on what was going on. Uh, there were something like a hundred video cameras on the ground that got the ascent of the shuttle. A couple more on airplanes that were chasing along with the shuttle trying to catch anything that might happen. And none of those cameras saw this fall off and none of them got the time either, even if they could have seen it. Um, so this clue uh, was very important in figuring out what was causing the foam to fall off in the first place, and eventually they solved that problem, by and large. Uh, because one camera on the external tank doesn't get both leading edges of the shuttle, if you look at this other figure, so the picture, um, you're really only seeing the starboard wing of the shuttle here, you can't even see the port wing. So uh, after a few launches, NASA decided to put one on each solid rocket booster as well, so we're doing those, or did those until last summer getting a really nice view of the leaning edges of both wings. So typically on a shuttle launch, we'd have three of these going and uh, get really good situational awareness about what's happening. So. And uh, we all know the shuttle program's done now, but uh, I like to think that the iconic image of some of the shuttle program is this sort of view now. We got some really spectacular stuff, especially at night. This is a night launch. and. Uh, some of these are very dramatic. This, this purple sheen on the normally black tiles of the orbiter is caused by the reflection of the blue earth on the orbiter as it's leaving the, the external tank. Because in this view, the part of the earth is already sunlit and the ocean's uh, reflecting off that surface. That's a cool shot. We're also very proud of the fact that uh, we did all the video on Spaceship One with Rocket Cam. These were very simple systems, all recorded except for one channel which was typically the, uh, this was typically broadcast live also. These were all recorded on board. The uh, recorders, you can see one right here, right behind the pilot, with a flip-up screen to show uh, the pilots when they turn them on just before they taxi to put uh, whether the thing was pointing in the right direction and working. But uh, for Spaceship One, I think these kinds of onboard images are what everybody remembers it by. It's not so much the ground-based stuff, although all of it was really cool. So. Uh, you remember that, especially this one. It was, uh, it's it's uh, satisfying to go to the Air and Space Museum and see this thing hanging up there with all the other nice planes. So uh, we're hoping to do something like this with uh, Spaceship Two. Now, a little lesson about branding. Uh, everybody's seen this video from SpaceX Falcon launches, and I've done informal polls at, at uh, conferences and speeches and stuff, and almost everybody thinks we did this too. Turns out this is the only one we don't do, pretty much. 
and uh, it's a branding lesson. When you get a market penetrated pretty well with your brand, it doesn't really matter if people uh, know for sure whether you did it or not. It's what, what's important is that they think you did it. And so I've had people after speeches by Elon come up and congratulate me for the great video, and I say, well, I have to tell them it's not really ours, but thanks anyway. <laughs> but uh, the guy who did this at SpaceX used to work for us, so it's very similar to our analog video system. But it's, it's all good. All this is good. So we had a limitation with the analog system. Uh, we started wanting to get on spacecraft. It turns out Earth orbiting spacecraft, especially in low Earth orbit, don't get tracked 90 minutes every orbit. It's usually little periods of four, six, eight, ten minutes. And uh, there's important things happening in between, so they all wanted some way to store the video and then downlink it later. And that's not easy if you just turn the video on and do nothing else with it. So we needed to invent some avionics that would do that for us. And we had uh, a need for more sensors besides two or three. We wanted to digitize the video because the analog video is a bandwidth hog. We needed to manage the bandwidth, uh, compress the video as needed. So we had to develop some avionics boxes that would do all that for us. And over the years, we've had several versions. They all started big and funky, like this one. Uh, we got a little smaller over the years, and then we now are selling one that's uh, relatively small. This is the size scale. The cameras are the same as what we've used all along. Uh, so that's, that's a, an avionics box and a bunch of cameras there? Yes, and a panel. That's a typical <laughs> business panel. Um, so um, I'll go into some of these applications just so you get a feeling for it. But what we're mainly doing with this avionics is uh, fundamentally we're managing bandwidth because bandwidth is a huge problem once you get these sensors going and there's always a bottleneck somewhere. The second thing we're doing is uh, we're compressing the video uh, sort of willy-nilly as the customer wants it compressed so we can vary the output depending on what they have available for bandwidth and for other, uh, for other needs like resolution. We also, uh, because we have such a good controller and scheduler in this uh, avionics box, we can do a lot of things like control other subsystem elements. We can control mechanisms. We can control data flow from other sensors that we don't even do, but they want us to control the sensors. So I'll give you some examples of that. First thing I mentioned is compression. Uh, compression is huge for video because you can greatly decrease the total number of bits you're sho shoving through the pipeline, even though the human eye won't really tell a whole lot of difference. So this gives you a feeling from that same picture. Um, Pretty much uncompressed, you can see a lot of detail there. Even as you go to fairly serious compression, here you're reducing the bit size, uh, total bit amount by seven. Uh, you're able to make that out pretty well, what it is. After you get really aggressive, it starts fuzzing up on you. But a lot of our customers will gladly accept this if they can just get more data. So we do that a lot. The first example we had of uh, being able to do this on a spacecraft where we had a really severe bandwidth problem was to watch a very extended uh, four-hour deployment of a very large antenna on a geosynchronous communications satellite. It was commercial it was for a company called ICO and the uh, total deployment time was four hours. We only had 200 kilobits per second to work with, which is almost no more than a nice, um, a nice frame on your typical small camera you, you hold in your pocket. And we had to somehow cover this deployment. It's a dish antenna about as big as this entire lecture area here, 12 meters across. So we, uh, we put this on a commercial satellite. Had a small system that uh, actually had three cameras looking at different views of the um, antenna. And you can see this thing coming out and eventually deploying full, full width. And it worked like a charm. The whole thing was on for four days. We're about to do this again on another spacecraft uh, in about two months. We did a similar system on a spacecraft called EchoStar 11 uh, as, as part of a commercial competitive experiment against DirecTV by DISH Networks. And uh, what they wanted to do was offer a channel that DISH, they knew wouldn't, wouldn't be offered on DISH. And uh, so what they have, and it's still operating up in geosynchronous orbit, is this view of the Earth on channel 287 of DISH. And if you haven't seen it, that's because you're not a DISH subscriber. That's the only place you can see it. And uh, the spacecraft is parked over the longitude of Denver at the equator. And it returns this view every day, 24 hours a day, no interruptions, no commercials except for some background music. And uh, you get a little time tag at the bottom that runs along and tells you what day of the year it is and what time of day, but that's all you see. And the only thing that changes is the weather. 
the uh, terminator of the Earth goes around and around every day, 24 hours. And then once in a while you see a uh, total solar eclipse go across the western hemisphere of the Earth. And uh, about every month you see the moon go behind the Earth and walk across the screen and come right, come back again. And uh, it's pretty cool. This is a view, same view, only at sunrise on the eastern hemisphere of the Earth, or the eastern limb of the Earth. When the sun is directly opposite the spacecraft at basically local midnight, the entire rim of the Earth is glowing like this because there's enough light that comes around, it gets refracted, and you see a ring around the Earth. Another fun mission was uh, the LCROSS mission that NASA sent to the moon a couple of years ago, three years ago now, um, needed a controller for all of the sensors they had in mind, and they also wanted a situational awareness video just to see the impact and the approach and impact as they went into the moon. This was directed to the South Pole with uh, the Centaur stage impacting purposely in the depths of a permanently shadowed crater trying to dig up some dirt into the sunlight. And this vehicle and all the other telescopes that were available monitored the plume as it came up, the dust plume, to see if there was actually water ice in that dirt. And uh, so what we did with NASA Ames was uh, they built a payload panel, one of the six panels on the spacecraft, they had nine different sensors looking this way and that way from the vehicle. Our avionics box was controlling all of that, and one of those sensors was the video camera right there. But most of the rest of them were infrared of some sort or another. That's a better way to detect dust. So in October of 2009, we were approaching the moon, heading for, I believe, I think it was somewhere right around here in this crater. I've kind of lost my bearings since then. But that's a, that's a snap right off the monitor of the, the visible video going in. And it was uh, really fun to watch as this thing got closer and closer. This is a comparable image as we are even closer of the infrared view. Of course, it's color, color enhanced, so you can kind of tell what's cold and what's hot. But the cold crater uh, basin is right here, and they were heading basically where this guy's finger is pointing. And it turns out the impact was uh, successful. The dirt plume went up and uh, all nine sensors after they crunched on the data for quite a while saw the impact and saw the, the remnants of what was left there and the end result is uh, between these observations and orbiting observations from other spacecraft we now know that on the south pole and the north pole of the moon there's something like a trillion tons of water ice in the in the buried soils there and uh, that's a huge impact on future lunar exploration the most recent mission we're on that's at the moon is the GRAIL spacecraft. They entered uh, lunar orbit in the end of last year, in the 1st of January. Two different spacecraft, they're talking to each other with very precise signals. On the spacecraft, uh, there's four camera systems, or a four camera system on each one that's going to be used for their education and public outreach program. <coughs> and uh, these are the hardware sets, uh, one on each spacecraft. As the spacecraft go around the moon, they're basically pointing uh, with their face to the moon all the time. And uh, there's one camera looking forward about 45 degrees, one looking aft, and then two looking straight down. And one of the two looking straight down is more like a telescope lens. It's more like a very nice SLR kind of lens. And uh, these will start uh, full-blown operations using middle school students as the schedulers for the video and the processors of the video clips starting this, uh, I think it's next Thursday, March 8th. So uh, shortly after launch, we were. this was a pretty exciting mission for us and for everybody else on the project. So shortly after launch, the systems were turned on to get a sample image from each camera. And uh, we were happy to see the first image come back, which is that, which was looking into nowhere in deep space. And we saw absolutely nothing, which is what we were hoping to see, because the cameras can't detect stars. There were no planets, no moons. So we knew it was working, but we didn't see anything. Once we got to the moon, they took a few more sample images. This is all from video now. It's not a still image, but it's a video frame from a 30 frame per second video. And you can see at least one of these cameras is working great. So we're looking forward to getting all sorts of interesting video clips eventually on YouTube, I think, is where they're going to put it. Uh, that avionics I showed, that's still too big and clunky for a lot of these spacecraft and rockets, and especially smaller spacecraft. So. As I mentioned earlier, we've shrunk this avionics down now so that they're all about this size, and all we do is add more slices if we want more functions. 
This is sort of the minimum complement of slices. Uh, one controls the power coming in from the host platform and distributes all the voltages we need. The other one controls the command and telemetry to the host platform so we can talk with what we're based on. And then the third slice, this one is controlling eight cameras in this case. We have another slice that will control two high definition cameras or two high speed cameras uh, or a couple of infrared cameras. So you can mix and match these slices and come up with some clever solutions to things. This whole thing, uh, the avionics weighs a, uh, 700 grams, it's not very heavy, and each camera weighs 200 grams. So coming up this, uh, hopefully in April or so, uh, maybe even later, depending on how the launch pad improvements go, we're on the new uh, Ari uh, Antares rocket for orbital sciences, brand new liquid rocket, first time they've ever done a liquid rocket, and it's going to be launching a cargo vehicle, the space station, which will carry uh, not humans, but cargo. And we're on that as well with a video system that will watch the approach as we go to space station. So, we're looking forward to that. That's a, a nice kind of project to be on because we're on both of the vehicles and it uh, helps our business. Here's the complement for the Antares rocket that we'll be using. There's a, uh, an external pod camera just like we use on Delta II and Delta IV. We've got a couple of internal cameras to look inside the payload fairing at the spacecraft as it's going up inside the fairing. Since you can't see anything inside a fairing if it's still on because it's pitch dark, we have lights that will illuminate that whole scene give you a view of what's up there. And then the uh, basic avionics is the same as what I showed earlier, but uh, we also added a transmitter because uh, they wanted us to take care of transmitting our own, our own data. And we also added our battery pack because they didn't want to supply power. So that's kind of a typical solution. I mentioned uh, Virgin Galactic. Uh, we're supporting with a couple of systems right now the flight test program, and that's mostly to support the National Geographic production specials. They have a contract to do four specials on this effort with National Geographic. We're supporting the producer, providing a couple of high definition and, and standard video channels. There's, I think, on the total uh, for both vehicles, probably up to like 10 channels of video going all at once. And uh, they come from a, mis a, a mixed uh, bag of sources, but we're getting the job done there. This is, uh, if you haven't seen it, one of the recent flight tests where they feather the, the uh, aircraft wings. Those are going well. Can't wait to see the full-blown uh, rocket-powered flights later this year. Other things to look for is uh, the Orion capsule that's uh, being funded by NASA, being built by Lockheed Martin, is supposed to be going through a shakedown uh, flight test on a Delta IV rocket in 2014. We'll check the whole system end to end, and we're supposed to be on that launch and supply some situational awareness video of the entire operation. A lot of mechanical things happening, so they want to watch that closely. Likewise, for the Boeing uh, CST capsule, it's a commercial, commercially developed capsule for uh, commercial crew to NASA, to uh, space station. We're expecting to be on the flight test program for that. We're also talking with uh, Sierra Nevada to do uh, some supporting video and data acquisition for their Dream Chaser drop test later this summer. We're going to be dropping it from uh, the Virgin Galactic White Knight 2 and dropping the thing down and landing it on a uh, runway, I think, at Edwards, but I'm not sure about that. If, you, if none of you are interested in space stuff, we're also on some cool platforms uh, like this car. It's a supersonic car. Uh, it's called the North American Eagle. It used to be an F-104 uh, supersonic fighter jet, and now it's a car, and they're hoping to go for uh, a run next summer, uh, summer 2013, at 800 miles an hour or more. The current record is 763. So, um, that's, uh, that's going to be a fun ride if they get that. They're up to, uh, test runs are up to 425 right now, and I've been to a couple of those. They're fabulous to watch. A little longer term, it's not clear when uh, Mr. Bigelow is going to get his larger modules up into orbit. Uh, there's two of them up there now that are subscale models, but we're hoping to uh, outfit some of the larger modules with video. They've uh, procured a lot of systems from us, but there's no firm plan to launch these modules yet because uh, before he can do that, he needs reliable commercial crew capability up and back, and that's still coming. So these might be 2015 or 16, but uh, not around the corner yet. Um, other missions we're going to be on, I won't show images of them, but we're on quite a few of the remaining Atlas launches. Uh, some Delta launches are left. 
We're on several spacecraft, uh, geosynchronous orbit as well as low Earth orbiting, and uh, quite a few classified spacecraft that we don't even know what they are or where they're going, but they're, they're classified. That's all we know. We've got about six of those lined up. And we're on quite a few missile defense target vehicles still. There's probably another dozen of those that we're on that basically launch out of Hawaii, launch a target up to space, and then it's intercepted by some of our missile defense interceptors and shot down. It's all testing. So uh, that's where we are. I'll cut it off there and take questions till I'm cut off by Scott. Yeah. Um, care to uh, comment at all, if you can, about some of the regulatory challenges of putting high quality optics in space? Yeah, it's interesting. When, when uh, EchoStar approached us about the uh, imaging system to look back at the Earth, much to our surprise, we found out we had to have a remote sensing license to do that. And it's from the, uh, the Department of uh, Commerce. And, uh, okay. And so uh, to, to have that system operating, we had to first apply for a license, and once we got the system designed, we had to explain to them what we're going to be looking at and with what sort of optics. We said, these are just little tiny cameras. They don't do any remote sensing, per se. And they said, it doesn't matter. You're looking at the Earth. And it turns out, even if you're going to land on the moon with a lander, you know, like a Google Lunar X Prize lander, and look back and take pictures of the Earth, you still need a remote sensing. So that's a little weird. Uh, besides that, um, the only other regulations we have to deal with with this are the frequency assignments. And that's pretty important, too, because there's a lot of bandwidth coming down. So every single application has a specific frequency band you have to operate. But uh, other than that, the remote sensing license is all we had. And we had to prove to them once we mounted it to the spacecraft that it was as we designed it and we're looking at where we said we were going to look. We believe that's just so they know in case of a national emergency, they know where all the assets are that might be able to give a view of something that they need to look at. Like uh, on your digital systems um, that appear to be integrating pretty tightly with the spacecraft hardware the themselves, um, what kind of data bus protocols do these satellites use? Is it just something standardized? Yes, yeah, uh, we use standard as much as, po as much as possible. So we use RS-422, which is a very standard serial data bus. <coughs> we are starting to work with uh, GIGI, which is a very common camera bus that goes to our electronics. Uh, we have. Occasionally done other custom protocols when the spacecraft didn't want to change theirs. And we can do that too with RS-422. And uh, one thing I should say about these digital systems is what we do is take almost all the complexity of adding video from the, uh, on the spacecraft or the rocket. We take it, the complexity away from the host platform and put it on our side. Of the so we don't confuse their computer. We just have to turn us on and we do this. So it simplifies it a lot. One, one, one last question. Um, you said um, uh, earlier that you digitize the video um, uh, to save bandwidth. Yeah. Um, what kinds of rates did you get before and after? Uh, what kinds of bandwidth did you use? Oh, we. Uh, there's two ways we can. Well, we can digitize the video, uh, 30 frames a second coming in or whatever. We do that all the time. First way to reduce bandwidth is throw away for throw away frames. Right. Because that's that's too much video sometimes. So. On this uh, Earth viewing image, for example, we only had 200 kilobits per second to work with, so we only kept one frame every 15 seconds of video, because nothing's moving down there very fast. So that's the first way. The second way is just compress the actual frame and crunch it down. We can reduce the bits by a factor of 10 easily. So, whereas our box uh, could easily put out 100 megabits per second, uh, we're typically throttled back to like one or two megabits per second, or less. And that's for like eight cameras or? Well, it's typically one or two cameras flowing video at once and we switch between them. The most we can do at once is four right now. But we're still having to live within about a few megabits per second. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well,